who have signed up this morning. Good morning. Those who have signed up this morning and couldn't be here live, but wanted to join us uh, by recording. Thank you so much for making time on this gorgeous, uh, gorgeous um, Tuesday morning to join us today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our second uh, summer school webinar. And uh, what we're really hoping to do is to connect with women over the summer months leading up to the accelerator and, and deep dive into some important conversations about where we're at with uh, leadership, with our individual leadership, with our collective leadership here in Canada and, uh, and how that it, you know, affects us globally as well. I have the pleasure of introducing my guest to you today. And, uh, and Ricky Asadi, uh, thank you for being with us this morning. I am going to read a, a description of Rikia that I have found on her website, and it's actually the one that we used in our magazine article. If you haven't read that yet, she was uh, kind enough to do an e interview with me uh, for our magazine. So I'm just gonna read that now and uh, tell you a little bit about her. This is the best description I've found so far, so I'm just going to keep using it. Born headfirst into a Muslim, Catholic, Jewish, Anglican family, Rikia Sadie has traveled and lived around the world working in Vancouver, London, Paris, and New York as a strategist for governments to global advertising agencies, combining culture, cultures and contexts with a passion for politics stoked by intervals abroad and through her own company's drive for new models of social change, she has been engaged on leadership and election campaigns at the civic, state and national levels. Researching and writing articles on topics as varied as the war in Afghanistan to the Norwegian study of democracy to education reform, the breadth of her portfolio is only matched by the infectious energy and curiosity that drives her every that drives her every commitment and desire, frankly, to build a better world. Quite simply, Rakia Sadi is a gifted communicator and one of the most passionate people I know. And I wanted to credit uh, that gorgeous and accurate description to Salima Ibrahim, the CEO of Artery. Good morning, Rakia. Thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Um, so as you can imagine, I was extremely happy to, um, you know, my passion for, um, for building relationships, meaningful relationships and digging into um, creative and, and dialogue with powerful women. So you can imagine when I first met Rikia, I was intrigued. And when I first met Rakia was actually seven years ago. And sometimes building those relationships takes a while, takes time, takes investment. When I first met Rakia, it was here uh, in my home in the beautiful Sunshine Coast. And she was here at our Writers Festival. She, it was 2012, the summer of 2012, actually almost seven years to the day. And Rakia was at the Writers' Festival with her new book in 2012 called We Are Canada. And she read that book. And as she read it, I just fell deeper and deeper in, in love with this woman and this so obvious leader. And I knew nothing about her except for the words that she read. All I knew was I need to get to know this woman. And that's how it actually ends out for me in, in a lot of relationships. So, um, Ricky, I wanted to start out by just asking you a little bit to just reminisce for a moment about this book, We Are Canada. And I'm wondering if you can tell me what meant the most to you in writing this book. Well, I wrote the book because I traveled across the country and I had come across so many different perspectives, perspectives of our country and who we are. I grew up in Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta, and I have a giant crush on Canada. I think Canada is in many ways a role model for the world, 
but we don't have the confidence to own that because we've made a lot of mistakes in our past and we've done a lot of things wrong. And I was trying to create a frame that would help us to understand and put those mistakes in context. We have a saying in our family, if you learn from it, it's not a mistake, it's a lesson. And, you know, I was hoping to turn some of those mistakes into lessons because frankly, they have built who we are today and who we have the potential of being. And, uh, and I felt that that was a story that had to be told. It's, it's a beautiful story. I love that. I think that we, um, I believe that we are a role model for the world. And, and I, I know that we have a long ways to go, but I also believe powerfully in that. Um, so I'm curious, and my next question is, you know, it's the summer, it's seven years later, it's the summer of 2019. And let's pretend for a moment, let's play pretend for a moment. And, uh, and you're working on your second book. And this book is actually called, We Are Women Leaders in Canada. <laughs> if you were writing that book, and I hope you are, if you were writing that book, what would the message of that book be at this time? Well, I think the subtitle would be, you got this, babe, <laughs> because it's all about love. Leadership always is. And you've got this because I don't think we as women and as leaders understand how far we've actually come. And that is a, a peril of our species for sure. I, I often say to people, look back and see how far you've come. It will do your heart good. And, and I think we're doing a lot of things right, but I think we're operating in an environment where we may not understand what we're up against. And I know, Char, you talk a lot about a revolution and a movement, and I think that's important, but I think it really can be a quiet revolution. And I think it needs to come from women, women leading among women um, and helping us understand the environment very often in the corporate world and I've advised at this point probably 200 companies um, NGOs organizations worldwide and I like I often get brought in as a marketing strategist but I really like to delve in as to what's going on in the organization because I believe that all good marketing is true I think that you're not trying to put lipstick on a pig the way you're trying to do is understand who you are and what you've built together and figure out the environment in which you're working and the, the best path for you to move forward, the most authentic and true path to who you are. But if you define it really clearly, you don't even have to market and sales because your tribe will find you. And, and that's what I was trying to do for Canada. And I really think that we as women need to do that. Often in the corporate world, you know, we young, much younger women coming up don't feel like feminists and they don't feel that women really have their back and they feel that the men are actually more welcoming and more friendly. And any of us who've been young women in the corporate world have had that experience. Um, it's not as benign sometimes as it seems, but I think that we need to first acknowledge can I just leap right in to mm -hmm. the framework? Because I had these philosophies and Shar came up with three fantastic words for them. Acknowledge, ally, and amplify. And if I can just leap right in, it, we first have to acknowledge the environment in which we're working. If you have ever read the comments on the internet, you know that we're up against something that young men aren't up against. And just yesterday, I was refuting people on LinkedIn who said, look, it's a biological fact that women aren't interested in STEM careers. I had a woman who is a very senior person in, in the past Ontario government say the same thing on stage at a major conference. Um, and every time I have to re-educate and reframe that, you know, 40% of STEM degrees in Canada go to women. Uh, that's a good number. I mean, we're not at parity yet, but equality is an equation, right? In any equation, if you remember your high school math, you have to work both sides of the equation. And this isn't, oh, rah, rah, women, we need to rule the world and let's stomp on men at all. I have two sons. I live in a house of boys. Uh, they're the most important people in the world to me. I think that we need to come up with a world that works for all. But on our path there, if you're beating yourself up and thinking, why didn't I get that promotion? Why aren't I in that leadership role? Why haven't I been able to get people on board? You need to first be kind to yourself and acknowledge that there are some prejudices and biases in society that we are still up against and we ignore those at our peril. Um, 
I'm sure if everybody had their, their volume on, you could tell tons of stories. I'll tell one about a, a national board I was on. I was the chair of the strategic planning committee. And at the start of a board meeting, uh, one of the members of my committee spoke first and he said, he kind of laid out the problem and the solution. And the chair of our board, another man said, wow, Ross, thank you so much. That's the smartest thing I've ever heard. I wish, um, you know, I'm so glad you went first. This is really revolutionary. It's going to change our organization. And Ross said, what are you talking about? Rakia says that at every meeting. <laughs> so it was a bit of an eye opener for me that we haven't won the battle. And every woman I know has stories like that. But we also have stories of men who helped our careers and men who are tremendous allies. And there are a lot of them out there. You know, there are books on how to do business from 20 years ago that are really about how to survive in a man's world. If you think about how women, when we first went into business, back, I remember reading Glamour magazine and it was, you know, the bow ties and the shoulder pads. And we were trying to fit into a man's world and prove that we belong. But the fact is, uh, everything we've learned since then, if you read Harvard Business Review, uh, there's been a study on the most effective way to improve teams. They, they studied every single variable. They studied IQ, level of education, number of years at the company, um, whatever variable they could come up with. And the only variable that they could come up with to, to determine the difference between good, strong, effective teams and teams that didn't meet their deadlines and didn't get the job done was the number of women on the team. Mm. And we have a tremendous gift. Thanks for the clap. Uh, we have a tremendous gift and power and the world is shifting and we just need to realize that. Same thing to take it back to Canada. The world is shifting and we felt thought we were at the back of the line because we weren't as homogenous and nobody knew what a Canadian was compared to what a German or a Japanese person was. But actually, as the world became more global, the door moved and now, you know, we're actually at the front of the line. And I think the same is true in the business world. And that's why I'm here today is to convince you that now is our time. Um, one of the best lines I've heard recently is your diversity is your permission to be in the room. That groupthink has gotten us into these problems that oftentimes, and I learned this from my father, a retired judge, he said, yeah, now that I think about it, women tell it like it is. Men, we sit around the boardroom table and we're kind of worried about what men, the other men will think of us when we speak, which I never knew. I, I just learned that from an 88 year old man, but it makes a lot of sense because I often find myself, and I'm sure many of you do as well, in a room where you're thinking, am I the only one that sees this? Am I the only one who can tell this common sense right in front of me? But because boardrooms and decision-making tables were so homogenous for so long, that group think sank in. And what, companies that are really focused on change and growth are starting to understand is if they don't get a diversity of voices around the room, they are not going to solve the problem. The more voices you have, the better solutions that you'll get. And so we need to work with those allies. There's so much that can be done, but the first step is having the confidence to believe mm -hmm. that even if you look differently than anyone else in the room, you have a right to be there. And perhaps that's the reason you have a right to be there. And diversity isn't just the color of your skin. It's really about the color of your lived experience. You can't tell by looking at someone what their experience is. When I did the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference, I was the only person who lived in a small town on my bus. Um, you're, you're segmented in these teams of 16, and then you report back to the Governor General. And I didn't realize what an asset that was until people started making comments like, oh, that's what small towns are like, or small towns are always like that, or what would you expect? And I was the only person on the bus able to give my lived experience from a small town where my uncle, who's Lebanese, Muslim, was the MLA, where our school principal was East Indian, where our good friends were Chinese, where all the pretty girls were Ukrainian, where my school was half indigenous. That to me is what a small town in Northern Alberta looks like. So whatever your lived experience is, it has brought you this far and it is your reason that you have every right to be in that room. So do you want to jump in? I'm, go I'm just going. I'm, I'm no, really excited. Well, I really well, believe that it's our time as women. Yeah. Because let's, we have so much to give. Let's recap. So 
Yeah, um, just because there's so much gold in there. But so the question, the question was, if you were writing a book for We Are Women Leaders in Canada, what would you, what would your message be? And Rikia is, is the gold in all of this is, you know, first and foremost, acknowledge, acknowledge where we're at, acknowledge how far we've come and acknowledge the playground in which we're still playing. Um, and then second, um, build your allies. You know, I think we've, we've heard that, you know, we've read the, uh, you know, the little articles on LinkedIn and whatnot, but have we really taken it to heart? Because if women are only talking to other women, we're cutting ourselves off from half of the population. So who are your male allies? Who are your male champions? Uh, powerhouses started to run in the last year, a campaign dedicated to bringing to men into the conversation called Men Who Mobilize. And I can give you tangible traction examples of how by doing that, more opportunities, access, connections, and relationships have started to blossom because of that campaign. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So your third point after acknowledge and allies, uh, Rikia, turning it back over to you, um, the third point of this book, what would that be? The third point is amplify. And this is not an original idea to me, but I wish I'd thought of it. It came out of the tech community in San Francisco where women were finding um, there's a, there can be a real bro culture in a lot of startups. I've advised a lot of startups. Um, and they were finding that their answers weren't being heard or that their ideas were being taken by others and, and other young men around the table were running with them. And at one company, a group of women got together to brainstorm solutions and they decided that at every board meeting, they were going to amplify each other's thoughts so that they could actually be heard. So a woman would answer a question or give an idea, and then right after, another woman would say, you know, I really like Carol's idea. I think she's onto something because blah, blah, blah. And what that did is, first of all, it made people pay attention because now they've been told this twice. Secondly, it pegged the idea as being Carol's idea in the first place. And third, it created this camaraderie and this teamwork that women were really able to succeed. Look, I'm not worried in the future about women getting a seat at the table. Um, the World Economic Forum just released a study saying that it's going to take us 208 years to re receive or to, to realize gender equality. And I don't think that's true. And the reason I don't think that's true is that a lot of things are a mess right now. And when things are a mess, that's usually when women get a chance to have a seat at the table. Like Mary Barra, the first CEO of General Motors, nobody made Mary... CEO when things were booming. They didn't make Mary CEO in the 50s. They didn't make her CEO in the 80s. But right now, when GM was about to go under, when they were bailed out, when electric cars were coming at them, where millennials were reducing their car buying, that's when they say, okay, let's put a woman in charge. And I've seen this over and over and over again. I've also seen women who are CEOs still fighting for their voice to be heard and for a seat at the table. A, a CEO that I advised, we were brainstorming on a new name for her company um, and a new strategic vision. We nailed it. She was so excited. She went to text her male partners, her CTO and her founding partner, and she paused and said, wait a minute, I work with two men. How can I make them think this was their idea? And I thought, holy crap. <laughs> but this, I don't think men realize that this is what we're up against. You know, back to my dear old dad. I remember hearing my first feminist speaker in university coming home and telling my father that she had told us that how women tend to defer to men. And when we were walking down a path, if there was a man coming in the opposite direction, a woman would often step to the side and let the man go. I haven't conducted an experiment to see if this is still true. But my father was horrified. He said, I'm a gentleman. I would never let a woman step aside for me. I, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, I'm going to prove it to you. And he came home the next day and said, oh my God, women were stepping aside for me all day long and I never noticed. So this is taking us back to that acknowledge because it's not a level playing field. Let's not pretend it is. 
we have talents, they're proven, they're being talked about in Harvard Business Review. But the fact is Canada created a gender balanced cabinet in 2015. And it's the first time in history that I ever heard debate and pundits and people arguing about the merit and the capability and capacity of people in cabinet. And the previous cabinet had dry cleaner owners in it and farmers and college dropouts and people with high school diplomas and nobody ever questioned whether they were qualified to sit at the cabinet table because they were white men. I hate to say that, but it's true. And then all of a sudden we have a woman who's participated in a Nobel Prize, she her names on that Nobel Prize and she's our new cabinet minister for science and people are saying, oh, but she got in because of gender. And that's not fair. And there, there's going to be some not fair things, but we can't let them get us down. Mm -hmm. So if we build our allies, if we work with people, if we remember that everybody is a little bit scared, everybody is nervous. I've now gone into boardrooms just thinking these are all frightened children who don't know what's going to happen next because we are living in uncertain times. And my New Year's resolution this year was I'm going to stop judging people for how they carry their burdens and just marvel that they're able to carry them at all. Mm. So we are amazing at teamwork. We are amazing at compassion and empathy. We are amazing at speaking our truth and speaking our mind and not suffering fools gladly. We are amazing at moving things forward and getting things done. I often um, tell women, at, at, there's a nonpartisan women's campaign school that I've spoken at many times. I took it myself in 2005. And I always tell women who are thinking of going into politics because, you know, after you have children, if you choose to have children, uh, it's the busiest time of your life and you're frazzled, but it's also a time when you become so aware of the world around you and what you want to leave for those children. And that's when women often get interested in politics. And what I tell them is, if you can get a toddler to put their shoes on and leave the playground, you can convince the CEO of anything like that should never be a setback in your career you've learned to multitask you've learned to take on more and more responsibility women get shit done it's who we are and i think we need to own our strengths take our strengths and make them our strengths and don't let anyone define them for you as a weakness because they are not and so you need to look around the room we all need to look around the room and see who can i amplify who are the women that can work with me? Who are the men who can work with me as allies? And how can we get our voices heard? Because your voice is really important. Hmm. Thank you so much. That it's gonna it's gonna be a powerful book. That book that you're writing. Yeah. <laughs> how I just plan, planned that. No. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. Keep our conversation rolling, and. Uh, the 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 when Rikia and I first talked about this webinar, I really wanted to hit on uh, because she is a strategist. You know, I really wanted to get her views on. You know, let's she talked about some of the environment in which we are living right now. She talked about the GM Motors as an example of. You know, I think we're up to bat. I do. I feel like women are up to bat and. Uh, for those who know me, I, I tend to ask women the question, what are you ready for? So if you're up to bat and you actually get called up from the farm team, you get called up to the big leagues. And I always use sports analogies because it's what I, rela I relate to so easily. But, uh, you know, are we ready? Are, are we ready? And uh, part of today's webinar is just taking, stepping back and actually stepping up and having that 30,000 foot strategic view of leadership as women right now in Canada. Now that can be our, our own leadership, a strategic view at, as to where I am at as a leader or our leadership. And if we were uh, meeting this morning and we were having a brainstorm about coming together to create a very powerful 10-year strategy about mobilizing more effective, well-amplified, coordinated, communicated, efficient leaders in Canada, primarily focused on women leaders, 
what would that mobilization strategy look like? What would it feel like? And uh, the one thing I'm gonna ask each of you to do is answer this question for yourself, and then I'm also gonna ask you to answer it in the chat, if you're willing. I'm gonna ask uh, Rikia this question, uh, and also to share her thoughts on, you know, why is a mobilization strategy important? You know, why, why, why am I so driven by something like this? Um, and, you know, I think she's got some thoughts on, uh, from, from her own training in, in yoga, actually, believe it or not, this very diverse woman, um, that, that I think would be actually really important components of a mobilization strategy. So before I jump into that, Fill in this question, each of you. And you can use the chat if you're so willing because it'd be fun to look at your answers. In just one word, please describe the number one need, number one need to successfully and effectively mobilize powerful leaders in Canada faster than we have evidenced in the past. In just one word, what do we need Ooh, to more I... effectively? Oh, go for it. And I'm also going to open up my chat just on the bottom of my screen, and you guys can do the same. But if you had to give that one word, word answer, what would that be? And, and Rakia, what, what would you say to that? I would say, bless you, but it's not going to take a 10 year mobilization strategy. It's Gosh, going to take not. women stepping up and believing that they're worthy, believing that they're ready to leave. It all starts with us. We can say, oh, the system is rigged against us, and oh, we have these challenges, and oh, it's not fair, and we can do that until the cows come home. But the simple fact is, we have to believe that we're ready to lead. And I, I keep thinking about, there's a major crown corporation in British Columbia that needed a new CFO and it did an external search. And instead it chose a woman internally and the board met with her and said, we've, we've done an exhaustive search you know, across the country and we've decided that we want you to be our CFO. And it was such a great coup. She was quite a young woman in her thirties, early thirties. And it's not a happy story because she tried to talk them out of it. She said, no, 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 it can't be me. Like, I don't think I'm ready. Like, and so that's very kind of you, but she turned it down. And fortunately, there were some great allies on that board and they wouldn't let her turn it down. And she went on to become a brilliant CFO of a major corporation. Mm -hmm. But when our time comes, we can't say, no, I'm not ready. Or gee, do you think I'm good enough? And if we can get that confidence piece of the puzzle, we can do anything. Mm. It's that confidence that seems to be missing in our gender, that belief that we have that power. And it's conditioning, it's, it's other things, but in the end, it boils down to us. I am of a belief that if you're over 18 years of age, it's 100% you. Everything is your responsibility. And that personal responsibility is the most important driving force that we have in this world today if you see something out there you want to fix and we all do it we love to go on social media and we love to say oh look at that bad mind it's polluting and and but do you like shiny things do you enjoy diamonds and gold because if you do that's what's fueling the mind and absolutely every problem that you see in the world you can find a solution that you can fix in yourself. And it's all about personal responsibility because um, if you take a look at companies or government, we love to rail against corporations or against the government or against unions or whatever your political bent is, there's, there's an enemy, there's an other, right? It's the dictator's playbook. You, uh, you get a charismatic leader and it can be of a country, it can be of a company, it can be of anything can be a media personality and you wait for an economic downturn or if you're in government you can even create one and then you say are you not doing as well as you thought you'd be in your life it's not your fault it's their fault and then all of a sudden everybody gets ramped up and excited because they have this enemy to fight and that's ridiculous because you know what companies and unions and corporations and governments are people 
groups of people every day, either taking the easy way out or doing the right thing. And when you have whistleblowers, when you have people who stand up and say, this isn't right, then you're starting to see that level of personal responsibility because if everybody in a company or a corporation or a government or an NGO did the right thing that they knew in their hearts to be true and to be right, there would not be corruption. There would not be problems to fix. We could all have this kumbaya, lovely, happy experience. So number one, I would say you have to own your life your mistakes and warts and all. One thing that's kind of interesting about this post-privacy world that we live in is that our mistakes are no longer career ending things. Uh, people are just coming forward and saying, here's, you know, here I am, flaws and all. I've, I've asked young women to run and, and they've said, oh, I can't, I was a single mom or, oh, I had a pregnancy when I was young or, oh, I dropped out of school and didn't go back for four years or, those aren't scandals anymore. I'm sorry. And women have to stop with this Victorian thinking that we've made these horrible mistakes and we are no longer worthy to be in this world or to be at the table. The change has to happen in us. So if you can think of a mobilization strategy that gets us to get out of our own way, we could win this like a flip of a switch. It could be over tomorrow. We could all sit at the table with confidence and pride. And I think the thing you're talking about, um, I'm an internationally certified Kundalini yoga teacher, which uh, I always joke that my MBA hides a lot of uh, side, side things, but one of the, the founder of Yogi, of, of Kundalini yoga, Yogi Bhajan taught us that in order to lead, in order to make change, you have to poke, provoke, educate, and then elevate. And I, I guess I'm doing a bit of poking and provoking right now when I say, really, it's up to us. Integrity is all we have. My definition of integrity is consistency in thought, word, and deed. And my favorite, most powerful saying in the world is, integrity and timing carry extraordinary power. Often as women, we think that we failed because we couldn't push the needle right away or because things didn't go exactly as we wanted. But as I've gotten older in my career, I've stopped trying to push the noodle. I've realized that every great project, every great leadership opportunity, everything has its window. And if you hold yourself in integrity and you build those alliances and you stay determined and you stay clear, you will find yourself in a position of tremendous power. And I don't mean power over people. I mean power over yourself because that's pretty much all you have to lead with. That's all any of us has to lead with, right? Leadership isn't a, a power position. Leadership is a place of service and it takes a very special person to be able to, not to be able to, we all have it in us. Um, we all have the power to lead, but to want to mm -hmm. serve others and elevate them and lift them up. That is a rare gift. And if you have that gift in you, just start using it and then you'll be a leader. Mm -hmm. There's I, a filmmaker from Vancouver, just a quick thing, but you know, he wanted to be a filmmaker. So we started making films and now he's in Hollywood and he's doing great. But when people write him and say, how did you get a break? And can you give me a break? He's like, whatever it is you want to do, just start doing it. That's a man's confidence. And I'd love to see more women have that confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Whatever it is, just, just start doing it. Uh, I, I see a lot of people that get paralyzed by perfection or the perfect plan. And it's just, you know, just take imperfect action. Um, but I, I just got to recap um, the Kundalini steps, because honestly, if I was, if I was creating a mobilization strategy with you, with all of you, I, I really do think they're quite ingenious. And I, um, Poke to me is about being curious, poking at something. It's not working. This could be better. What, what's this all about? Poking is also about stimulation, stimulating a conversation, stimming, stimulating a new connection, uh, a new relationship, not being afraid to poke. I'm, I'm not afraid to poke. I'm, if you know me, I'm not afraid. I'll poke you. Poke you down, yeah. Um, then <laughs> it's also about asking um, a question. You know, it's about asking tough questions, poking someone if you don't understand something. Uh, the next step is provoke. 
provoke is, you know, change and transformation are not easy. When I speak with women, with friends, with colleagues who are frustrated about something, I'm happy for them because I know that they're going through the eye of a needle. When I talk to someone and everything is just, you know, comfortable, that's when I get worried. Because <laughs> comfortable, not that it, it, it can't be easy and have a life filled with ease, but um, comfortable can also be mistaken for complacent. And I know that when we're growing, it's, it's not always easy. We're pushing up against, we're provoking. Um, the next piece is educate. And, and that is part of what we're doing today. Just coming together, convening, learning, talking, sharing. Not always from a place of what don't I know? What do I still have to learn to be ready? But what can I share with others? How do I create that, that reciprocity and, and sh the sharing and exchanging of information? And then finally, elevate about uh, how I feel when I talk about elevation. It's that feeling of lifting up and letting go of anything that we don't no longer need. So what I heard from Rakia today, one thing that we need to do to elevate, to actually move higher and forward faster in leadership is to let go of the notion that it's going to take us 10 years. But if there's something or that we want to do, yeah. yeah, or 208, you know, if there's something that we want to do, just start doing it. And, uh, and, and I, I do think that that's um, definitely what we're excited about. Um, Rikia, I, I wondered if there was one more angle that you wanted to go. And I also, and I, I have an idea here and that's, it's around the, the different levels of power and actually talk. Oh, that. I'd love to get into that. But first I want to answer yeah. a couple of the things you talked about. Okay. Um, yeah. Just do it. And the thing is, okay, so what are you going to lead? Right. We can all take leadership. We can take leadership in our families. We can take leaderships in our lives. We can take leadership of ourselves. Right. There are many things that I know. I can do to lead my life better. Um, that's an ongoing thing. But, but really, what is it that you want to lead? What do you think needs to be different? And you need to find those like-minded people. Someone is already doing it. Um, when I spoke at the Global Youth Assembly years ago, I, I was talking to all these young people who were already change makers. And I said, look, you know, you need to form alliances and find more people because what's happening is too much division. Um, I actually, actually recently had a woman who wanted me to help her set up her NGO to, to deal with a specific species of bee, to save that bee. And I said, well, first step is, are there other bee NGOs? And, oh, yes, yes, but they're dealing with other species, or this one's dealing with this habitat, or this one's, I'm like, look, when people want to save bees, they want to save bees, they don't care about which bee, you know? <laughs> oh, no, 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 we can't work together. We really see the problem differently. And I thought, there's the problem right? We can, we can say, say your, your passion is the environment. You can save species by species, habitat by habitat, region by region. There's global organizations like WWF and Greenpeace, and they're all competing for resources and time and talent and treasure. And that's not necessary. The first step, if you want to lead something, is find people who share your vision and your values, who care about the things that you care about, and join with them. There are countless leadership roles and hierarchies are flattening. This idea that there's one CEO at the top and that they make all the decisions and everybody else has to abide by it, often without consultation from the people who then have to implement, it's killing companies, organizations, and governments. It's killing them. And it has to change. I work with CEOs and they are the loneliest people you'll ever meet because they are making these drastic and difficult decisions pretty much alone. There's very few people in the organization they can talk to if they don't have an organization with a flattened hierarchy and a more broadly based decision making model. That's where we have to go. And that creates also tremendous opportunities for women to lead because that's how, how, we, how we like to work. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I just want to say to what you were saying about that comfort, getting out of that comfort level. Don't be afraid of conflict. Conflict is not a bad thing. Conflict is a precursor to change. So 
when you are experiencing conflict, it means that something's not right. Something's not sitting right with you. Something's not feeling right. And it's not, maybe it's not having alignment between your vision of what your life could be and what your life currently is. Maybe it's conflict between where you know your organization needs to go and where it currently is. If you're feeling that conflict, don't make the mistake that many women do of making it, think, thinking that you're a bad person. You are not a bad person for having conflict. You are a growing, vibrant person with a lot to contribute, and that's why you're feeling conflicted. Mm -hmm. And then get to the root of that conflict, and then go through the steps. Acknowledge it, find your allies, amplify your message, get people on board, and that's how you lead. You don't need a title to be a leader. So I get a little passionate about that one. That uh -huh. one's so one of the things, and, and then I'd like to flip gears just uh, as we head into the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I, I'd just like to review some of the answers that came in in terms of what's the number one need that needs to be filled, because uh, I think some of the answers are, are really um, important. So there's an answer on we need more mentorship, connection, uh, support, vulnerability, network development, togetherness, uh, to, uh, self-worth, courage, strength, confidence, inclusion, imagination, reset, curiosity. I hope I didn't miss anyone. Um, I asked a, a colleague of mine who's helping me with um, uh, some facilitation in uh, at our accelerator coming up in September this same question because we're going to be asking our participants that and um, and her answer was cohesiveness uh, we need more cohesiveness and that speaks to you know the lady that was gonna start her a new NGO to work with bees because I sometimes feel the same if, if, if all of the women, all of the organizations and groups that are mandated to support women moving forward uh, were more cohesively connected, coordinated, and well communicated amongst each other, that would be a huge win. Um, and uh, my answer, I have two. Uh, the first one is faith. So it, it, it's uh, for myself and for those I work with, I, it's around courage, just having courage and knowing that you're ready to step fully into it. So faith is pretty huge for me. And then I think the other word that I've been really pushing at and poking at recently is uh, the word reciprocity. I would love to see um, collaboration fully like stretched and leveraged and reimagined and that whole word of reciprocity, um, I'd really like to take that to the next level of working with women, working together with women, whether that's through joint venture or through unique arrangements where gifts and talents come together. I think we're just, we've just scratched the surface of what is possible in terms of we're stronger together. So um, I'd like to- I think those are fantastic words. Really I know. Words. I love, I love every them. one of them. Yeah. And, and I just want to say like, whatever your word is, that's probably the thing you most need to do. Totally. You most need to find in yourself or you most need to reach out. Um, mentorship, connection, support, you know, are you mentoring? Are you finding the people who think as you think? And it's hard. It's really hard. Um, we are living more and more separate lives, which is not how we're meant to be living um, at home on our phones in our little silos. It's a hard way to parent. It's a hard way to live. It's, it's lonely. Loneliness is something, you know, I live in a chaotic, chaotic household. So I didn't realize how prevalent loneliness is um, until a young man who top of his career, you know, he had this thing called, well, I won't say it because that'll out him, but he had this group who got together for a very specific reason and it was all guys. And I said, you know, you, you should probably open that up a bit. And he said, you should never criticize anyone who's doing anything to bring people together because we're all really lonely and we need that. And it was such an eye-opening experience and it was such a vulnerable thing to say. And when we are vulnerable, Back to bring us full circle, you know, where we came in thinking we had to act like men to be in the business world. But the fact is, the only lasting change you make is, is from your vulnerable heart. Mm -hmm. The only way you get your voice heard in a crowded environment 
is by speaking a vulnerable truth. And that's why Brene Brown is doing such incredible things right now. And I think really shifting the dialogue in a powerful way. But I just wanted to leap in and say, yeah, if that's your word, wake up wake up every morning and say, how can I get more of that in my life? Because in doing so, you will be leading. Mm -hmm. To just uh, close out our conversation, I'd love to, to tackle one more topic. And that is the, we, we touched on it the other day in a conversation, Rakia, the, the three levels of power. And I wondered if you wanted, or if you could speak to that a little bit, um, maybe I'll let you introduce this, you know, this part of it. I have a couple of thoughts around it as well, but um, I just want to make sure that this conversation about leadership or is covering off all of those levels. Well, this was an eye-opening conversation for me with a friend in Cambridge um, who had taken a course at Harvard. Uh, Julie Batiana, I believe, is the professor who founded this work, and the friend was Lauren Bacon, who's a brilliant visionary herself. But I was asking her questions around this idea of, of power. We were discussing the political world, and she explained that there's three types of power. That the first is your personal power. It's your ability, it's your superpower, it's the gifts you bring to the world, it's who you are and what you have. That's your personal power. And we're all familiar with that, although I would say again, women underestimate that power greatly, right? You know, there's a superpower in getting a kid to leave the playground. That's awesome. Um, there's a superpower in being the one who organizes all your family members and keeps the memories alive. Um, there's, there are superpowers that we have that we discount because they're not monetary. Don't do that because those skills are transferable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your personal power. The second level, help me, Shar. The second think. is relational. Thank you so yeah. much relational power and that again women are so strong at right it's your power of your relationships the power of your networks um i was always uncomfortable with networking and people would talk about my big network and i would feel really cringy and a lot of women feel that way because i felt these are, this isn't my network these are my friends these are people i met i thought they were doing neat things we help each other we learn from each other um but that's what a network is and uh, women build really healthy networks. It's, it's seen as one of the reasons why we live longer than men is because we're so good at that relational power. Um, and relational power is really important for getting things done. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything alone. And if you try, it's not worth it. I really fundamentally believe that in this century, for any project to be worthwhile, oh, that's, that's going to open up a whole new can of worms. In Canada, I think for any project to be worthwhile, it needs a gender lens and a lens of reconciliation. But I also think globally, for any project to be worthwhile, it needs a group, a group effort. Solo efforts aren't really that powerful anymore. So relational power, which is something we've always been good at, is on the rise. Mm -hmm. And then the third kind of power is positional power. Uh, that is the power you have by virtue of your station. Um, it's the power you have as CEO. It's the power you have as chair of the board. It's the power you have of being the head of the household. And uh, anyone who has kids knows that that's not actually that much power and it's a little bit fleeting. And I think that's true of all the other positions as well. I, I've spoken with so many uh, retired men who feel less than, who feel uh, shrunken, who are, are depressed because they're now retired and they, they can't figure out why their life feels so meaningless, but it's because they were so wrapped up in their positional power that when that positional power goes away, they've lost something of themselves. The thing that uh, Lauren taught me about Julie's work that I think is so important is that every one of these powers is contextual. You move out of that organization, your power shifts. You, you change your relationships, they shift. In any different environment, my network may be incredibly powerful to me in one context and kind of useless to me in another. You know, my son's at a new high school. I don't know anybody there. I have zero relational power in this school. Whereas when my kids were younger, I had a lot of relational power because I did so much volunteering and they were little and I hung up in the playground and I, I was great at introducing people and getting all the different cultures to mingle. And, you know, that power is very contextual. But, but when you have that information, that's a bit of a superpower. I thought it was a real gift to be taught about those three levels of power that are being taught at the Harvard Kennedy School. So mm -hmm. I hope you find them useful as well and that they give you 
food for thought. Yeah, I, I really, I, I wanted to, to highlight those today because I think they're, uh, even though it's a simple concept, it's very important. And I think a lot of times um, women, we do work on our personal power. Uh, I think we could take it to the next level. Um, but I know a lot of women that are always looking for their next personal growth opportunity, their next coach, their next, and not that that's not important, but I also try to point out to women that um, building up their, their, their reputation and their brand and who they are within their, their community and their network and their ability to influence beyond their current position is also important. The only thing you take with you to the next position or opportunity is is you. So your your title is great and use it, you know, use that position to the best of your ability for everyone involved. But um, but it's also very important that if that position should end, um, you know, that 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 reputation and who you are and the leader you are moves with you to the next opportunity. Um, but I don't want to underplay the importance of um, those positional opportunities because yeah. if we're not at a decision making table, if you know there there is opportunity there for us to make huge difference, whether that's in Absolutely. local politics, on boards that we care about, you know, where, wherever we're getting involved, um, if we're not making those decisions someone is making them on our behalf. So, so all of those three pieces are so important, personal, relational, and positional. And I really wanted to just highlight that again today as I part agree. of our and actually strategy. Say, if you understand that it's three different types of power, then when you have positional power, you can use it for good, not evil. You can understand that it's contextual. And you can say, okay, while I have this positional power, exactly. what are the greatest, most powerful things I can do for the greater good? Exactly, yeah. It, it, and that's yeah. really, to me, what leadership is. Leadership is taking your gifts, who you are, and what you've built in this world, and using them to help others do good in the world. That's it. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today, for taking uh, some time out of your schedule and for each of you for joining us. Uh, the webinar today, this whole idea of mobilization and leadership and what is leading at a higher level look and feel like is all, it's all a precursor to our upcoming uh, accelerator that we are hosting in Regina that's coming up the end of September the 25th through the 27th so I am hoping I know that some of the women that are on this call today are, are going to be there with us and I'm so excited about that uh, I am hoping that you will take a, a, a good hard look at uh, at considering joining us in Regina the end of September uh, if that's at all a uh, possibility for you we will continue with these conversations online because they are so important uh, thank you for being with us today and um, yeah Rikia thank you so much for for being with us today any final thoughts before we close uh, just I I'm I loved your comments I'm so excited to meet all of you on Twitter I'm Rikia s r i k i a s I'm not my Twitter game is not that strong, but if anybody wants to reach out to me, that's a great way to catch me. Great, awesome, yeah. And if uh, if again, I'm happy to share Rikia's coordinates online uh, if you'd like to reach out. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And any questions, don't don't hesitate to let me know. Thanks, Thanks very much. A lot of fun. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Bye now.